State Senator Brad Hoylman, thanks so much for joining us here on New York Now this week. Thanks for having me, Dan. So let's talk about something called the statute of limitations, because I feel like a lot of people probably don't know what that means. It's basically the time that you have when something happens and then the time that you have to either charge someone with a crime or sue someone over that that kind of deal. So you wrote a letter to the governor with a bunch of other Democrats in the Senate, uh, maybe in the assembly, assembly too, I'm not sure, asking for the statutes of limitations statewide on any crime or civil action, lawsuit, that kind of thing, to basically put, be put on pause. Tell me why you wanted that to happen. Because as we now know, it's Wednesday when we're talking, it has happened, they have put everything on pause. That's right, Dan. And uh, the reason it's important is that as you say, you're given a certain amount of time to file a claim, whether it's a civil or a criminal one, and that's important to preserve your rights as a litigant. And in this unusual time in which we find ourselves, where everything has been upended by this worldwide pandemic, it's not fair simply to cut off New Yorkers' time to file suits, whether they be criminal or civil. So we sent a letter on March 19th to the governor asking him to toll the statute of limitations. Uh, and he responded by doing so through an emergency uh, gubernatorial directive uh, the following day. So now prosecutors, litigants, uh, attorneys, uh, uh, you know, all have uh, more time to file these types of claims. Um, you know, there's precedent for it too, Dan. Uh, governor Pataki used his emergency powers after 9-11 to toll the statute of limitations, showing the need to do so uh, in this type of emergency. This is such a huge deal that I, I feel like people who may not be involved or have some sort of civil claim that they might want to bring, people who just don't know about the legal system don't recognize how huge of a deal this is to really have everything put on pause and have that access to justice be waiting for you whenever the state decides to lift the, the pause of these statutes of limitations. That, that leads into the, you know, the second uh, uh, issue that, that I've been working on, which is the Child Victims Act. As you know, uh, right. I passed legislation with Assemblywoman Linda Rosenthal, and it gave adult survivors of child sexual abuse the opportunity to basically go back in time, even though the statute of limitations had expired, and file claims against their abusers or the litigants who may have protected them. Well, on March 23rd, the Office of Court Administration announced an end to all non-essential filings. So unfortunately, Child Victims Act uh, um, filings uh, are considered non-essential. So we're fighting now to extend the Child Victims Act look back window by at least another year because it's simply not fair that we promise these adult survivors of child uh, sexual abuse one year to file these claims, but now uh, their opportunity has been cut off by nearly seven months given the OCA directive uh, to cut off all non-essential filings. And I should know, just because we've talked about the Child Victims Act for years now, and before the whole coronavirus pandemic hit, you were already pushing for that year-long look back window to be extended for two years. So I just wanted to mention that, you know, you were already pushing for that before this happened. You recognize that. Um, shifting because you are also let the... Say, let, Sorry, let go ahead. Just, I can interrupt. Yes, yeah. we needed another year, even, even without this worldwide pandemic, because first of all, we know that there are a lot of litigants who haven't yet gotten their act together through no fault of their own to take on what may be the most significant challenge of their lives, which is going to court and confronting an abuser. It could be a family member, a trusted uh, individual like a coach or a, a pastor. Um, and that takes a lot of courage and that takes some time to figure out. Uh, and then secondly, other states have done the same thing, Dan. Um, states like California, New Jersey and Hawaii have all uh, extended their revival windows as a matter of course. So in this extraordinary time, uh, with COVID-19 interrupting our judicial system, um, we need to give survivors every opportunity to, to, to file these claims. And also from the perspective of public safety to help us identify predators who still may be in contact with, with young people and children. 
So you're also the Judiciary Chair in the Senate, which is a committee that deals with state courts, uh, issues affecting lawyers and the legal system overall. How have you seen the state's courts change and adapt to this entire situation? I'm sure it's something that you've had your eye on. I'm curious how the legal system is uh, really responding to this pandemic. Well, you know, some things change and some things don't change at all. There's still, believe it or not, uh, ICE uh, you know, concerns uh, around courthouses. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can ban ICE from from going to courthouses and around courthouses and arresting uh, members of our immigrant community. Uh, but what I have seen, though, is a very nimble court system overall. Um, the chief judge working with the chief administrative judge, Larry Marks, and the governor and issuing these directives that preserve justice. And that's what we're talking about. As as New York pauses, along with the rest of the nation, um, we need to make sure that nobody is disadvantaged uh, from a legal and judicial standpoint. So that's that's what we're operating on in terms of proposing to the governor, fighting for items in the budget that, uh, like the Protect Our Courts Act, that will ensure that justice um, justice is in fact. Uh, 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 available to, to New Yorkers during this extraordinary time. Speaking of issues of, of justice, you have this bill. We talked about it. I think you were up here two weeks ago. It could be last week. I don't know. Time is escaping me right now. But you have this bill that would prevent price gouging on consumer goods during a, an emergency like this. Tell me about the bill, how you came up with it, and how it would benefit people. Well, uh, you know, we saw at the beginning of the uh, pandemic that folks were going to grocery stores and pharmacies and loading up on hand sanitizer and Tylenol. And it, and not only were they doing that, but at the same time, the prices were raising by, you know, uh, 25% or 50% or more. There were bottles of hand sanitizer that were going for $25 for, a, you know, a small a small container. That's that, crazy. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's wrong. It's unfair. Uh, and it's that's why there are laws against gouging. Unfortunately, New York's gouging anti price gouging statute is rather vague. It it limits uh, these types of um, uh, uh, crimes, if you will, to uh, a price point that is deemed unconscionable. And that's generally for a court to decide. So we could see that type of legislation, while it might be effective, it could take a lengthy time uh, to determine whether a consumer um, was in fact price gouged by a retailer. So um, I think that New York should follow the example of states like California and New Jersey and the District of Columbia and actually set a definitive price point um, that would um, indicate whether price gouging has occurred. That'd be better for consumers. Uh, it'd be better for retailers to know if, uh, you know, what the bright line rule is. And if their distributor is gouging them, um, it, it would be uh, something that the d distributor could, uh, uh, you know, be, um, be, be responsible for, not the retailer. So um, not only does this bill set a 10% bright line rule, but it also gives the attorney general more powers to go after these price gougers. And that's so important during this time of scarcity and um, you know, unease in, in a lot of our communities where the lines you know, going outside of Trader Joe, wrap around the block, uh, seniors are having more difficulty um, getting their essential you know, uh, medical items as a result. And everyone is, you know, is, is concerned about uh, you know, what the next uh, weeks and months are going to bring. So before I let you go, I, I have to talk to you about the state budget because it's due uh, by the time this airs, it'll be due in less than a week. And you have two big issues in it that I, you've been working on for a, a few years at least. So a ban on flavored vaping products and the legalization of gestational surrogacy, two huge issues, both for you, the governor, and a lot of other Democrats in the legislature. Um, just quickly, can you give me an update on either of those? Have we seen any progress while everyone's kind of working remotely on this? Well, for starters, uh, 
on e-cigarettes and, and flavors. You know, that's a very relevant topic. It's been relevant for several years now as we've seen the number of middle school and high schoolers who, who vape skyrocket. More than half of high school students in New York have, have, have vaped. And it's creating a whole new generation of, of nicotine addicts. Well, we also know um, from preliminary studies that people who vape are more susceptible to COVID-19. Um, and any prior lung injury, including what they call popcorn lung and other issues caused by vaping, puts you at greater risk uh, from the coronavirus. So I'm extremely hopeful uh, working with uh, my assembly colleagues and uh, and uh, the Senate Health Chair Gustavo Rivera, that we'll be able to ban the retail sale of all flavored um, vaping products in the budget. Governor Cuomo has been a steadfast um, supporter of this effort, uh, and we really need to protect our kids and address this public uh, health issue. Uh, this the second uh, the second issue you mentioned uh, surrogacy um, is. Also on the table, I'm happy to say, uh, still at this point. Now, granted, this table sometimes is lopsided, so things slide off. <laughs> but as I as I know it today, it's still being discussed with the assembly and Senate uh, leadership and the governor. Um, the Senate has uh, supported my legislation to legalize um, compensated um, surrogacy agreements and give LGBTQ New Yorkers and um, people who struggle with infertility, the opportunity uh, to have children. So, um, you know, it'll create this clear legal guidance regarding a child's parentage before they're born. And uh, I think uh, create really much needed protection. Uh, in fact, they, we will have the strongest protections of, uh, of surrogates in the entire uh, world uh, through our surrogates bill of rights. And it ensures that a surrogate can make her own medical decisions, choose her own doctor and have uh, access to multiple uh, protections uh, through the legislation. So um, New York is one of only three states that doesn't allow these types of uh, agreements. And unfortunately, New Yorkers are going to other states. Um, my husband and I had to travel 3,000 miles to California where the laws are very good. They protect both surrogates and um, the intended parents. But in places like Arkansas and Alabama, where surrogacy is legal by virtue of the law being silent, none of the parties are being protected. And so New Yorkers are going there and um, making themselves vulnerable, as well as, I would argue, um, you know, causing potential harm to, to women who act as surrogates and donors and every other party to these types of arrangements. So let's raise the standards um, in, in the country by passing the strongest surrogacy laws uh, in the nation, and I think we'll have made it better for all the parties. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, State Senator Brad Homan, for joining us via Skype for New York Now this week. Thanks for having me, Dan, and uh, stay safe, wash your hands, and we're doing social distancing as we speak.